everyone. Welcome to my presentation on mixed methods research design. I enjoyed engaging with this research method because I find it sometimes has the ability to paint a more complete picture for researchers compared to sticking with only qualitative or quantitative research, especially for those concerned with public relations and communications research. After a brief introduction to mixed methods research design, I'll discuss the three studies I chose to review, all of which have a common theme of cancer-related health communication. I spent a few years working for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada, so that's where my interest draws from for this sort of stuff. And since everybody will be touched by cancer in some way, either yourself or someone you know, I found the studies important and relevant. According to Creswell, mixed methods involves combining quantitative and qualitative research and data in a research study. As we've learned already, Qualitative data tends to be open-ended without predetermined responses, while quantitative data typically uses closed-ended responses like you'd find on a questionnaire. A researcher would pick this method assuming the collection of diverse types of data provides a more complete understanding of a research problem. Depending on the type of mixed methods research, data will be integrated at different stages of the study. There are several subcategories of mixed methods research design, but in the field of public relations, communications, and social sciences, the following mixed methods designs serve us best. Convergent parallel mixed methods research is when the researcher converges quantitative and qualitative data to give a comprehensive analysis of the research problem. In this method, both sets of data are collected around the same time. Explanatory sequential mixed method is when the researcher first gathers quantitative research, analyzes it, and then builds on the results with qualitative research. Exploratory sequential mixed methods is very similar to explanatory sequential design in that the data collection happens in sequence, but it's actually the reverse. So the qualitative research is gathered first to analyze the views of participants, and then that info is used to build the quantitative phase of the study. There are more advanced methods such as trans formative, embedded, and multi-phased mixed methods, but in the interest of time and relevancy, I'm just going to mention them in passing as they seem to be especially useful for very specific research problems. In public relations and communications, qualitative research is often used to support quantitative findings. Qualitative research can be designed to understand the views of a specific group of people that might have stuck out during the quantitative analysis. For example, you could use in-depth interviews to learn more about something that stood out from a quantitative questionnaire. Because of this, researchers and PR professionals can understand complex reasoning in much more detail than through the results of a simple survey. You might even end up with data you didn't know you needed or that might be useful in the end. You'll also give participants the chance to answer and speak for themselves in their own language rather than using research terminology. This too can lead to a greater understanding of the results. While all this may make it seem like mixed methods research is the best possible tool for PR researchers, experts caution to always develop a rationale for mixing methods before you start. Know when and how you're going to integrate the data. It can actually be more difficult and time consuming than using a single method because you have to do solid research with two different research methods, and then it can take just as much effort and time to integrate what you've learned from both methods. So it's very much a three-step process. Now that we've covered the basics of mixed methods research, let's get into the studies. This first study is authored by Champion, Barry, Kingsley, and Spence, and it's titled Pink Ribbons and Red Dresses, a Mixed Methods Content Analysis of Media Coverage of Breast Cancer and Heart Disease. The research looked at media coverage of breast cancer and heart disease and stroke in a local Canadian context through quantitative and thematic content analysis. The authors were concerned with finding insight into how these diseases are framed in Canadian media, which might impact a person's understanding of the diseases. They chose mixed methods because quantitative analysis allowed for the verification of the hypothesized relationship, for example, that Canadian media covers breast cancer much more than they do heart disease, and qualitative analysis to discover new patterns as well as existing ones. For example, breast cancer pieces often frame patients as survivors and fighters. Because all the data was collected at the same time, this is an example of a convergent parallel mixed methods study. Some limitations of the study include only English language media pieces were collected for analysis, so the results have a bias to English language media consumers. Second, because media was collected online only, it's possible certain stories appeared on TV or radio but didn't end up in the study. And third, the study period was only over five months, so it doesn't reflect a full year's coverage.
The results of the study weren't entirely surprising. We all know that we'd almost immediately recognize that pink ribbon for breast cancer, right? Well, what about the red dress for heart disease? Maybe not. I know I wouldn't. The results showed that even during Heart Disease Awareness Month, there were still more media items pertaining to breast cancer. The quantitative research revealed stories about breast cancer that were longer, more frequent, and more prevalent than prevalent, I should say, than those that had to do with heart disease and stroke. Stories about breast cancer were also more likely to appear on the front page instead of buried in the health and lifestyle section, like those to do with heart and stroke. Qualitative research revealed how media portrays a typical survivor of breast cancer and that good citizens and businesses should help with the cause. When it comes to heart disease and stroke, themes often lean towards prevention, individual responsibility, and the ways glamorous fundraising events reinforce femininity and privilege. Since the data revealed coverage of heart disease and stroke is lacking compared to that of breast cancer, I'd like future research to look at how communication professionals might be able to work towards getting heart disease and stroke in the headlines. It'd be interesting to look at the pink ribbon model to see if any of the tactics and themes from the pink ribbon campaign could be leveraged for heart disease. Perhaps there are even other health campaigns that could serve as a case study for this. The study could also serve as a benchmark for future media analysis of breast cancer and heart disease and stroke to see if there are any changes in years down the road. Authored by Goldsmith and Miller, this second study is titled, Should I Tell You How I Feel? A Mixed Method Analysis of Couples Talk About Cancer. It came about because of conflicting research on the benefits of open communication in regards to cancer within married couples. While health professionals regularly encourage couples to engage in open, honest communication, there's really weak evidence to support this is the best policy. They were concerned with things like the extent to which participants talk about their feelings, whether or not talk about feelings is associated with distress, functioning, and relational satisfaction, and how correlations between talk about feelings and distress can be explained. On the qualitative end, 19 patients and 16 partners participated in in-depth interviews about their communication. Following the interview, the same participants completed a standardized measure, which is basically a questionnaire designed to quantify attitudes or perceptions. This study is another example of convergence mixed methods as the data was collected at the same time and analyzed in tandem to create a more overall analysis of the research questions. In terms of limitations, I thought this study drew from a fairly small sample size. Participants were all gathered from the same upper middle class university town, and perhaps it would have served the study better if the participant pool had been a little more diverse. I was also surprised the authors didn't include any ethical considerations. The majority of participants would be in a fairly vulnerable physical and psychological state from cancer treatment or from living as a caregiver or through the loss of a partner. And I would have liked to have seen what the researchers did, if anything, to address these concerns. They also would have had to deal with highly personal and confidential health information and didn't mention if pseudonyms were used to protect the identity of the participants. The results were somewhat surprising, especially considered we're always told that open and honest communication is the best policy in marriage. Even the authors were surprised by these results. This this study is kind of a big deal. The data showed partners who stuck to the medical facts and didn't discuss emotions and feelings were less stressed and experienced greater relational satisfaction than those who attempted open communication. The qualitative analysis, that's the in-depth interviews with participants, found multiple ways to cope that didn't require talk about feelings. The findings suggest we should reconsider advice to couples on how to communicate throughout treatment for cancer. While the study revealed talking about your feelings isn't always the best policy for couples navigating cancer treatment, it didn't discuss when, how much, how long, how often, or to what effect these conversations should take place. Perhaps future research could tackle those questions to provide further advice to couples and healthcare professionals working through the intimidating world of cancer care. Now, the third and final study is the one that we're going to focus on for my discussion questions. Torp et al. were concerned with the financial and social effects on children and adolescents when a parent is diagnosed with cancer. This was a fairly massive national study. It took place in Norway. Potential participants were found through cancer care clinics and a national registry, and surveys were distributed 15 to 39 months after treatment. Of the 2,522 distributed surveys, they went out in the mail, just a little over 1,300 were returned. Of those 1,343 returned surveys, only 386, or 29%, of past patients lived at home with at least one child, so they ended up making the final participant pool for the study. 
First, Norwegian cancer patients living with children completed a questionnaire that asked questions like age, sex, marital status, current financial situation, financial situation prior to diagnosis, whether or not the diagnosis had anything to do with their financial situation, and whether or not the cancer diagnosis impacted the allocation of financial resources to their children. This made up the quantitative phase of the study. For the qualitative phase, researchers conducted in-depth interviews with 10 children. I was happy to see the researchers chose open-ended, loosely structured interviews, especially since many of the children were quite young. It was more like a conversation than an interview, really. In addition to interviews with the children, researchers conducted a short pre-interview with the cancer-diagnosed parent to get a little more insight into the material and financial situation of the family. In considering the results of the study, it's important to note that this took place in Norway, which is kind of an anomaly. Norway is very good to their citizens. I wouldn't expect these results to be mirrored if a similar study took place in the States, and the researchers even briefly mentioned similar studies in Australia, the U.S., and even Canada do not mirror the results of this Norwegian study. During the interviews, children were notably unconcerned with financial state and were much more preoccupied with topics related to their cancer-diagnosed parent and social relationships outside the family, like how the diagnosis impacted their schooling and friendships. In fact, only 8% of parents who were surveyed experienced a poor financial state because of the diagnosis. 8%, that's a crazy low number. And only 14% had to minimize spending on their children due to cancer diagnosis. I appreciated the authors noted that the Norwegian Cancer Society requested and funded the project, but were not influential in data collection, analysis, or findings. Again, researchers would have had to take great care in maintaining confidentiality in dealing with the majority of this data. I also appreciated that when interviewing children, if the cancer-diagnosed parent had passed away, they would interview the surviving parent instead of the child. I mean, think about the varying psychological vulnerability of these participants. While children were much more concerned with helping to care for a sick parent and social relationships than they were about money, I do wonder how much of this is influenced by Norwegian culture. Obviously, the stats show not many families experienced a precarious financial state because of the diagnosis, but Norwegians in general do put a strong emphasis on family relations. This could have influenced the findings in some way, and as far as I can tell, the researchers didn't address it. Since research showed children's life outside the home seemed to be strongly impacted by their parents' cancer diagnosis, I think this would be an interesting area to explore for further study. Do Norwegian children suffer in school when a parent's diagnosed with cancer? Do teachers make concessions and exceptions? How do friends react, help, or make the situation better or worse? Research like this could help social workers and edu educators better navigate children dealing with a cancer-diagnosed parent. In conclusion, I found that the use of mixed methods research design allowed for a more complete analysis of the research questions and problems in the three studies. That was definitely a common theme. I also noted at least two cases where the convergence of data gave researchers information they might not have found if they had relied on a single research method. The first being the alternative ways that couples can communicate besides open and honest communication. That's from the Should We Talk About It study. The second being that while Norwegian children aren't so concerned with money when a parent falls ill, their relationships and outside uh, life to the home can be greatly influenced, which could open up doors for important future study. Just a quick look at the list of work I cited for this presentation. I look forward to continuing the conversation with you on the Moodle discussion forum. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you online.